So in this presentation, we're going to cover a little bit of context and talk about why anti-racist narratives are an interesting topic at this moment. We're going to define narratives a little bit, and then we're going to talk about who is in addressing the issue of anti-racist narratives in the development sector. And then we're going to talk a little bit about IED's research contributions to the space, share some emerging insights from our work, and talk through some next steps. So in terms of the context, what we know is that the devaluing of black lives across geographies um, continues, and we can see this in a number of ways, in hostile migration policies, in poor or slow responses to hunger and climate change impacts, and of course in the issue of over-policing in violent communities that actually turned into a very violent situation of over-policing that resulted in the killing of George Floyd in 2020. And what we can see is that because of that culmination of, of um, grassroots activity and disconsent, there became this moment of Black Lives Matters where we had a call for more anti-racism that people really responded to in quite significant ways. As part of that, there has been emerging conversations about the importance of decolonial and anti-racist practice as tools that we can use to really improve the outcomes and life experiences that black and brown people have in all sorts of different parts of their lives and in different places in society. We know that in response to some of these discussions about racism and equity, there have been some kind of pushback, if you like. There's been a rise of racist and xenophobic and quite sexist cultures. And um, that has led to this sense that actually there is no fixed idea about some of these issues. And so very different emerging ideas about racism and colonization are fueling and inflaming, if you like, social debates over what is truth. So really it's important for the work we've been doing to talk about what a narrative actually is. In the briefest terms, a narrative is a story, one that is expressed in written and visual content and something that actually makes meaning in society. So that's not reporting on a truth that promotes an already decided idea. Narratives may not always be overt, sometimes they're implicit. So, for example, a well-known development narrative might be that all aid is beneficial, despite some of the inefficiencies that we know are alive and well in the aid system, also despite issues like loans and conditionalities that come with them and debt servicing. So what we have to kind of think about in this work is the fact that narratives are not truths, they're actually somebody's idea of truth. They can also be quite messy and they are influenced by things that we learn in education, in our upbringing and from our lived experience. Narratives are also reflected in words that we use that hold power as well as images. And what we have found in the work we've done is that ideas and language are often promoted by the idea of what is legitimate. What is a legitimate idea or a way of using language in business within political leadership circles? And really what we find is that language and ideas that are alternative to the mainstream, not always seen as appropriate, can be crowded out, which actually limits the different ways in which an issue can be understood. So coming back to this question of whether narratives have power, there are lines of academic thought that suggest narratives have power in three areas. First, in forging identities, so shaping how you see yourself and other people. Second, in actually shaping your relationships between people. And lastly, there's this argument that a narrative holds within it conceptual ideas. And so we're often actually drawing on those conceptual ideas in the work that we do in sustainable development to actually influence and guide policy and guide practice. The last thing to note is that what is said in a narrative can be as important what is unsaid. So I'd like to share two examples of some narratives here. 
They're both about severe hunger in Kenya. So narrative A says, severe hunger among the most marginalized populations in Kenya is a consequence of poor governance and climate impacts. So what you see here in the narrative is that hunger is being allocated to two main causal factors. The first being poor governance, which really um, suggests responsibility for severe hunger lying with the Kenyan state. You've also got climate impacts, which for many people often suggest a natural vulnerability to hunger. In narrative B, we have something that says severe hunger among marginalised populations in Kenya is a consequence of foreign occupation and rule and dominance of food for export markets that came with that rule. Poor terms of trade, administrative and financial challenges of non-self-governance that over time have left the nation vulnerable to climate change. So what you see here is some joint responsibility for hunger going across countries, the nation state Kenya now, but also the previous state that was ruling, which was Britain. You see a much more complex picture of a range of factors um, all coming together to cause severe hunger. And actually climate change is no longer seen just as a natural occurrence. The vulnerability to climate change is actually being related back to another um, a few other things. And so what is important to note is that the two narratives are likely to lead to, quite, lead to quite different policy responses or practice responses in the work that we do. So with some of those definitions and examples laid out, I want to talk a little bit about where leadership around our anti-racist narratives is coming from, and particularly in relation to some of the issues um, that we work on in sustainable development. So it's, it's important to say up front that South Asian and African academics, including from their diaspora, have really led the way in talking about the importance of um, decolonial and anti-racist narrative and discourse as part of um, movements towards racial equality. We also have a very recent um, kind of resurgence in news and policy discourses around repatriation, reparations, sovereignty has been a big debate, particularly in relation to sovereignty of the Caribbean states from the British monarchy. Um, and there's been lots of discussion about dignity through the Black Lives Matter movement. We also know that there's been a big discussion about um, public figures. In particular, we had the Rose Must Fall movement that was really talking about how people um, from British government that led and administrated over colonial occupation and, and rule and people trafficking that came with that, um, the discussion is, you know, should they be celebrated in society or not? So there have been a lot of places that um, anti-racist narratives have emerged that are either directly or slightly related to the work of international development. So what has IIED contributed to this emerging conversation that's underway? We've recently published some research called Discomfort to Discovery. It's some research around anti-racist storytelling in the development sector. The research really set out a very simple research question, which was, is IIUD content maintaining or continuing racism? In that work, we had to define our own idea of racism. We set that out as being a political and economic hierarchy that is anchored in this idea of white superiority in relation to cultures, knowledge systems, institutions, also in relation to having privileged access to rights and resources. And we also acknowledge the fact that in that hierarchy, you have black cultures, knowledge systems, institutions being placed at the bottom of that hierarchy in a position of inferiority that also led to reduced access to rights and resources. With that definition of racism set out, we were able to work with an academic from Leeds University, Dr. Laura Hernandez, and together we co-created what we called a narrative analysis framework. It had six dimensions of racism 
that academic literature suggested were dominant really in, in development storytelling. I'm not going to go through all six dimensions. You can find this um, research on our website. But what I will say briefly is that there were a few dimensions that came up quite regularly when we analysed samples of our content in relation to this framework. So we looked at things like blogs, our organisational strategy, some briefing papers, and the types of trends and patterns that emerged was that our content is in the main colour blind. So we are avoiding discussion of issues of race and ethnicity. We avoided thinking about colonialism conceptually in relation to the um, sustainable development concerns that we work on. Attached to that, our content was quite apolitical. Um, we didn't really think about the political economy of the challenges that we faced. And those two dimensions of being colourblind but also quite neutral seem to work in tandem and be related in our work. We also found that saviourism was present. We were quite regularly positioning IIED and our staff in the kind of central position with people that we work in partnership with being quite marginalised. We saw ourselves, but also other majority white and Western institutes as having solutions. And what was interesting is some of that narrative emerged quite implicitly, while at the same time explicitly we did talk about the importance of agency and the agency in relation to our partnerships. So there was a tension that we found in our work that, that we feel that we want to also understand a bit more about. So IID's current research is really going a little bit deeper and starting to think about not just how different pieces of content have dimensions of racism emerging in them, but whether there are actually catch-all concepts that run through all of our work that have problematic components to it. And what we're seeing here is that the development concept itself that we draw on quite heavily for our work has baked into it some issues around being apolitical, but also issues um, around avoiding racial equity and challenges of colonisation. And so I thought it'd be useful to quickly talk a little bit about this development concept. Essentially, it's understood to be this continuum with developed on one side and developing on the other. We're all very familiar with it because of our work. But what we're less familiar with is the fact that baked into the concept on that side of the continuum that talks about being developed, we also attach this US European idea of modernity, what it means to be a good society. Um, and actually, in relation to developing countries, we attach some ideas about traditional cultures that are not seen to be as advanced or making as useful contributions to the world. We see this process of becoming developed as being something that can happen by transferring knowledge and technology and finance from the developed to the developing. All of this happening without recognition that actually it is this modern society driven by US and European culture based on economic models of exploitation and extraction formulated under colonial rule it is that extractive model that has allowed developed countries to reach, I suppose, this, this, this state of being developed. And so in that moment of actually becoming developed, other people have actually been underdeveloped. So there's that concept that is actually something that we're considering to be a challenge. Within it, there's this idea that actually you can solve development challenges with technological and financial rather than political fixes. Within the concept of development, we're definitely seeing that it is um, something that's discussed without a racial equality lens or prism. And when asked, we are actually quite uncomfortable discussing racial identities. 
we're quite uncomfortable naming this exploitative nature um, of economic systems that have allowed development in other parts of the world to happen. Because of these challenges, we're starting to think about some alternative ideas, conceptual ideas that can be used to talk about our work. And justice, something that actually recognises power dynamics at play in our work, is emerging as something that we're keen to look at in more detail. So we've seen a little bit about our research in relation to the development concept. I want to talk a little bit about how the development concept shapes the way we describe people and places. I'm going to draw on the example of Kenya and severe hunger again, just to illustrate um, a challenge that we're discussing in relation to stereotyping. So we find in development narratives, including some of our own, that we often talk about things like hunger and climate change as having an impact across a whole country. So you can see here, we're talking about te uh, Kenya. Kenya's got a population of 47 million people. We could say sometimes that there is an issue of severe hunger in Kenya. The reality is that there are 1.4 million people facing hunger in Kenya. That's happening in only eight of 47 counties. Some of the academic theory around why we stereotype speaks to the fact that stereotyping happens when you're writing or thinking about something from a distance and you're unable to grapple with the complexity um, that is at play. And so here it's been very useful for us to think about some of these complexities of when there is both wealth and poverty in a country and how we discuss that in relation to sustainable development and how stereotyping is actually a barrier to discussing some of that detail. So I'm going to move on to the next slide and we're going to just talk a little bit about some of the alternatives and how justice as a concept could provide some ideas for us in terms of tackling some of the problems that are emerging from our work. On the slide here that you can see that we are starting to think about how justice framing could work for IIED. One of the interesting things to come from the research so far is that many conceptualizations of justice, climate justice, gender justice, social justice, for example, they are often actually quite Eurocentric and they struggle sometimes to think intersectionality, um, sorry, to think in an intersectional way, particularly in relation to racial justice and decolonial thought. So one of the things that we want to do if we use a justice concept is to ensure that racial justice and decolonial principles are really key part of the concept. So with that, we're really flagging the importance of acknowledging contexts of both power and history in relation to racism, in relation to the human trafficking that we call the slave trade, in relation to economic exploitation and extraction. Um, you know, thinking about justice that acknowledges history and power um, it, it is a really interesting point for us to explore at the moment. We feel that if we can do that, it will put us in a better position in terms of actually naming how some of those histories and power dynamics have actually worked through political and economic structures or systems and even institutions. And those places are sites that can generate injustice, both in the past, but also in the present. And that naming those sites, those systems and institutions is a really important part of tackling injustice. One of the other things that we really want to think about more detail if we were to use justice concepts to talk about sustainable development concerns is, does this concept have the capacity to really pr promote solidarity between human beings to support ideas of democracy and autonomy and really can we think about how solidarity could actually be applied to the, the need to kind of recognize that we live alongside the natural world and we need to respect the natural world and, and the planet that that we live on one of the last concepts that we're exploring is whether it's important to recognise past harms and whether through recognising them we can learn about patterns and we can think about how 
to prevent harm in the future. So there's lots of really interesting tenants that are coming out of that very early thinking about alternative concepts to, um, to house our work. So here what I want to do is just have a quick look at what would one of our topics um, look like if we were to apply a justice concept to it. So the example here is our work on debt swaps for nature. Debt swaps work on this idea that you can take a developing country debt and either discount, amend or forgive it and the money that is um, released through that process is then diverted towards um, climate and nature financing. So if we were to think about our work on debt swaps um, being underpinned by a justice concept, we would, I think through our research, need to start considering whether the debt in itself, particularly in relation to developing countries' debt, is considered valid by the range of parties involved. We know that there, there are um, debates about validity of debt, particularly um, because of issues of colonisation. And so this justice concept may well offer us the opportunity to explore that through research in more detail. Up until now, our work on debt swaps have been based in economic narrative rather than justice ones, so there is something interesting there for us to, to look at. And essentially, the question is, would a different concept lead to a very different type of storytelling, but also different types of policy and practice guidance? So, um, as I said, we're still really exploring some of this um, research and, and there's lots really to discuss. So in terms of next steps, IID will continue sharing our research and gathering feedback. These insights are feeding internal discussions that are linked to our current um, strategic review process. And we'd really welcome any further discussion or feedback with you all. So please do get in touch. My email address is natalie.lati at iied.org. And thank you so much for your time.